So when we looked at the natural numbers, we talked about divisibility and we talked about the prime numbers. So we know that the prime numbers start with 2, 3, 5, 7 and so on. So how many prime numbers are there? So remember that a prime number is something that has only two factors, 1 and itself. Now it must have exactly two factors, so 1 is not a prime. So the first few prime numbers are 2, 3, then 4 is not a prime because 4 is divisible by 2, then 5, again 6 is not a prime and so on. So the question is, is this set of numbers, these prime numbers, is it a finite set or are there infinitely many prime numbers? Now if there is a finite set of prime numbers, there will be a largest prime number. So the same question can be asked by asking, is there a largest prime? So if it is a finite set, in that finite set, there will be a largest one. And if there is a largest one, then below that largest one, there are only finitely many numbers, so there can only be finitely many primes. So asking whether the set of primes is finite is the same as asking whether there is a largest prime. So what we are going to see is a version of a proof that goes back to Euclid from about 300 BCE, which shows that there cannot be a largest prime. And as we argued, if there is no largest prime, then it must be that the set of primes is actually an infinite set. So to go ahead with this, we need a basic fact about divisibility. So this says that if a number divides a plus b and it also divides a, then it must divide b. So let's look at an example. So supposing you say that 17 divides 21 and I write 21 as 14 plus 7. Then 17 also divides 14 and therefore it also divides 7. Similarly, if I say 6 divides 36 plus 24, which is 60, then since 6 divides 36, it must also divide 24, right? So this is not very difficult to prove. So let's prove it just to get a feel of how such proofs go. So since n divides the sum a plus b, a plus b can be written as a multiple of n. So let's call it u times n. Similarly, since we have assumed that n divides a, a can also be written as a multiple of n, let's call it v times n. So what we are told is that a plus b is u times n for some u, a itself is v times n for some v, and the question is, is b also some multiple of n? Does n divide b? Well, because of what we have just discussed, a plus b can be written as v n plus b because a is v n, and the sum vn plus b which is the same as a plus b is in fact un. So now we can do some simple rearrangement. So we can take un is equal to vn plus b and just take the vn to the other side and we get un minus vn is equal to b and so b is u minus v times n. So this simply proves to us that if a number divides a sum and it divides one part of that sum, it also must divide the other part of the sum and we will use this in order to show Euclid's result. So what Euclid said is that suppose the list of primes is finite. So if it is finite, then we can list them out and it's a finite set. So it's some p1 to pk. We doesn't have to be in any particular order. We can assume that p1 is the smallest one. It is 2, p2 is 3 and so on. But it doesn't really matter as long as this exhaustively uh, completes all the primes. Now we construct a new number, which is the product of all these primes. We multiply all these primes by themselves uh, to each other and then we add one. Right? So n is p1 times p2 times up to pk plus 1. So now the question is what is the status of n? So since we have assumed that the list of primes is finite, n must be a composite number because this is not one of the primes that we had before. Right? It's bigger than all of them because it's the product of all of them plus 1. Now since it is a composite number, it must have a factor other than 1 and itself. And because we have listed out all the primes, one of the primes among them must be a factor. So let's assume that pj is a factor. So pj divides n, right? So there is one in this p1 to pk, there is a pj which divides n. But on the other hand, let's look at this part, right? The first part. The first part is the product of all the primes. So pj appears in that product. So if it is one of the factors it, of the product, it must divide the product, right? So pj divides n and pj also divides one part of the sum. So remember what we said that if some number n divides a plus b and if some number a divides n divides a also, then n must divide b. So in this case, a plus b is the product of the primes plus 1 and a itself is the product of the primes and we have argued that there is one prime pj which divides both of these. 
So therefore, by that divisibility result that we showed in the previous slide, pj must divide 1. But of course, we know that pj is a number bigger than 1, it cannot divide 1. And so we have a contradiction. Right? So what is the contradiction? Well, we assume that n was a new number, was a composite number because we have exhausted all the primes. But in fact, it cannot be composite because then we cannot find a proper divisor for it among the primes. Therefore, n itself must be a prime. And notice by construction, n is actually bigger than all these. So it also shows that there is no largest prime because for any set of primes, we can always construct a larger prime. So this is essentially what Euclid did. So we know more about prime numbers. So prime numbers are very mysterious because their distribution is kind of unclear, but they also have important properties as we will see. So prime numbers have been extensively studied in mathematics in an area called number theory. So one of the things that is studied about prime numbers is how they are distributed. So as we go larger and larger in the set of natural numbers, how frequently do we find primes? So pi of x is supposed to denote the number of primes that is smaller than any given number x. So for instance, pi of 4 would be 2 because 2 and 3 are the only two primes below 4. Pi of 10 would be include 2, 3, 5 and 7. So pi of 10 would be 4 and so on. Now as you go larger and larger, the gaps between the primes become larger. And in fact, you can prove amazing things like the prime number theorem, which says that pi of x is approximately x upon log x for large values of x. Now it doesn't matter if you don't understand what this means, but it's important to understand that this is a very significant type of argument that you can give about the distribution of a set of numbers, which is quite in a way randomly distributed. Now in terms of modern applications of primes, it might seem that primes are very strange things and we would only need to study them in number theory. In fact, the famous mathematician G. H. Hardy once said that he was very proud of the fact that he did number theory and nothing that he studied had any application. Well, it is not quite true because primes as we will see are actually quite useful. So one of the questions that you might want to ask is given a number, check whether it is a prime. Now, of course, there is a brute force way of doing it, which is to try and enumerate all the factors by looking at all the numbers below n and dividing them in, but that is not considered to be an efficient way to do it. And in fact, this was proved by three Indian computer scientists from IIT Kanpur, Manindra Agarwal, Neeraj Kayal and Nitin Saxena in 2002, and it is one of the breakthrough results in theoretical computer science in the history of the subject. So checking whether a number is prime can be done efficiently. But what about the other question? If I know a number is not a prime, can I factorize it? So we know a number is not a prime, but how do I find two non-prime, two non-trivial factors, that is not one or itself? Now it turns out that there is no efficient way to do this. So this is quite paradoxical. We can check whether a number is prime or not, but if it is not a prime, we can't factorize it fast. And this in fact is the reason why we are so concerned about prime numbers, because we would like to find numbers which are not prime, but which are actually products of large primes. So they are factors are only large prime numbers. And this is very important in cryptography. And cryptography in this sense is something which affects not just you know military secrets, but it affects us in day-to-day -day life. Because whenever we do electronic commerce, our transactions are protected by cryptography to prevent unauthorized transactions from being executed on our behalf or for, to prevent them from being tampered with. They are all encrypted. And a lot of this encryption dis is based on the existence of large prime numbers and the fact that factorizing the product of two large primes is difficult. So prime numbers, though they are very exotic in number theory, are actually a very, very important part of our day-to-day -day life.